Earth is ancient. Billions of years old. A time scale. So vast that it is difficult for us to imagine. Yet it. Geological marks, provided by eons of time, allow us to piece together. Story of our world. We can't travel back in the past, but we still can. Reconstruct what happened. But what about the future? How will the world change? What will happen to this cradle of life wandering in the dark? How does? End of story? When it comes to human society, our ability to predict the future falls short. Happen. Is it a technological revolution, a stock market crash, or the collapse of a civilization? We have to accept that the future of our society is unknown and ultimately in our own hands. But Earth is different because over billions over the years, the Earth is governed by physical principles such as atmospheric chemistry, orbital mechanics and the radiative force. Things we do understand things for which we can even make predictions. So today I invite you join us for a journey through time together from the very beginning to the bitter end journey to the end of the world. To facilitate this journey, let's imagine that we have some kind of ability. Travel through time, from the origin of the Earth to its end. You. Essentially be a chrononaut watching eons play for the first time. Overall, we. That's about 12 billion years of history to cover. Useful tool for. Contextually compressing this vast ocean of time each billion years into one. Month. So Earth's history spans exactly one calendar year. Death is happening on the 1st of January and the 31st of December. On this scale, every day. The calendar then represents 33 million years and each second is 384 years. Preparing for your journey, you step into the time machine, it starts to warm up. And soon the blinding light fills your vision, nausea spreads all over you, and in. In the blink of an eye, we wake up in the beginning. Earth's first day. Stepping outside, it feels like you are on an alien planet. This is proto-Earth, 4.53 billion years ago. The surface is fractured. Formed very recently, and it is constantly changing to form new meteorites. Falling down, breaking the young surface. To the growing mass of the proto-Earth. You look at the two watches on your wrist. Our left shows that only three minutes of compressed time have elapsed, but your correctly shows that thousands of years have passed here on Earth. Looking back, you see a black sky covered in ash and dust with a faint. The shimmering sun is barely perceptible through the clouds. Original. The atmosphere at this time is hydrogen and helium, the same material from which the sun has also been formed recently. You watch for hours as proto-Earth accumulates more mass, yet actually shrinks in size. As the mass of the planets and gravity increases, it compresses the rock beneath you. You look at your left watch. Oh see that it just went to 7 in the morning while your right side reads about 10 million years. So far the composition of proto-Earth has been fair. Homogeneous, rock mixed with metals, but something changes around this time. Due to the compression of the fetal globe it has become hot. Not only this, but Ost of the accumulated material is radioactive, which in turn heats. Planet ahead. Surface and interior literally melt into one giant. And a deep ocean of magma. Heavy substances within this fluid, such as iron and nickel sinks under gravity to the very center of the proto-Earth, forming its important. As they move down, they rub against the mantle creating friction and heat. The planet gets hotter, melts more rock, and allows more iron to sink. A runaway heating effect occurs inside the planet. You've just seen the iron catastrophe, an event geologically long. Guessed about. Looking up at the sky, you see the aurora borealis. For the first time, as this newly formed iron core sets up a magnetic field. Around the planet, protecting it from the more harmful radiation of the young sun. As the day ends, this young world finally appears. Peace, formed after millions of years of upheaval, internal bleeding, and harassed reconstruction. But a shadow looms. For the pain of the Earth. Not completed yet. It is about to encounter a phenomenon of unimaginable force and power. 
one that will reshape the planet forever. On the second day, you look up at the sky and see another small bright disk. Also the sun sometimes comes into view, as it is getting closer and then. Retreat, the harbinger of doom. Then you know it's Thea, nearby. A recently formed world the size of Mars. But unlike the real Mars it. The body is gravitationally trapped in Earth's Lagrange point L4, but it is. Too big, too unstable, not just being pulled by gravity to stay there. Proto-Earth but also Venus and other planets. It spins erratically. Dangerously, constantly approaching. It's 7.02 AM that the sky turns black, and is. Is consumed by Thea as it begins its final fatal plunge into Proto-Earth. Because of its small size, it is a suicide race for Thea, a fight it cannot. Win. Yet it promises to wreak as much havoc as it can. Sacrifice Act. Worlds collide, a lot of them vaporize. And throwing Earth's newly formed terrestrial flesh into space. So violent. This collision is so powerful that it can be detected from hundreds. Light years away. Despite Thea's best effort, Earth somehow clings to her. Its existence deformed, unrecognizable, but still standing. What was a lot? The planet's material now orbits around it as debris. Some of it rains back down. Is punishing the Earth once again, but much of it dissolves through the buildup of gravity. It rings, then bunches are formed, then the moon comes out. You witness as midnight comes. Times bigger than you're used to, being 30 times closer than the modern day. The Earth has become apparent, as its daughter world now circles around its mother like a newborn fawn. Finally, the Earth can cool, can solidify, can move forward into her future. It's day five. Over the last couple of days comets have peppered the Earth. Each one has brought with it a supply of water, volatiles, and even organic molecule. There is now so much water, that today you see oceans forming across the planet. The sight of a cooler Earth covered in bodies of water calms your mind. For the first time, you see something that resembles the planet that you know and love. It's Spartan, desolate, devoid of any life, but for the first time, it looks like the Earth. What excites you now is that life could surely start at any moment and that you might bear witness to that first spark of emergence. January 14th. It's been nine days since the oceans formed by your clock, but 300 million years have passed here in local time. The last week or so has been surreal. The Earth has a special beauty in this untouched barren state. Wandering the surface, you find oceans, rivers, shorelines, each one a possible site for life's first moment. Organic chemistry is everywhere. Acetone, amides, nitriles, carbonyls and even amino acids. Today you explore a collection of hot springs up against the shoreline. Land that will one day become part of Western Australia. It's here that you detect a small body of water with an elevated ratio of carbon-12 to its heavier carbon-13 isotropic counterpart. You remember that life prefers to take up carbon-12 over carbon-13, due to the lower energy cost of working with lighter molecules, and so this hints that life might be active here. You find the warm pool of pale water along the shore. It's loaded with organic molecules, alcohols and sugars. Excitedly looking at your scanner, you detect proteins, self-replicating chemicals, RNA, and protocells. It's delicate, primitive, but unmistakably alive. You doubt that this pool is really the first instance of life, but it's so basic that what you're looking at is surely nascent. You pause in profound epiphany as you look down upon what is essentially the origins of you. Your 4.1 billion year old ancestor, clinging to his newfound existence, barely able to survive, even in ideal conditions. These tiny cells will one day shape the world. As the days and weeks pass by for you, you watch millions of years flick by. Life has percolated now across the waters of the world. Despite being limited to simple microbial forms, macroscopic mats of these organisms, called stromatolites betray life's expanding presence. The young sun is almost a third less luminous than the one that you know. 
but the Earth's atmosphere is rich in heat-trapping carbon dioxide, keeping it warm enough for life to thrive. As the ambient supply of sugars dwindles, with fewer cometary deliveries, each day, life begins to adapt. On February the 1st, you find the first signs of photosynthesis within some cyanobacteria. These organisms pull in carbon dioxide and water molecules and use sunlight to forge their own sugars, producing oxygen as a waste product. At first, the oxygen levels are barely noticeable, but these photosynthetic life forms are so successful that they become ever more abundant. Beginning March 6, you detect a rapid rise in oxygen levels, now creeping above 1%, 2%, 3%. But life on Earth is not adapted to an oxygen-rich atmosphere. This highly reactive molecule actually poisons much of Earth's life. You watch in despair as mass extinctions sweep across the planet, killing about half of everything that lives. In this era of change, the first eukaryote cells evolve. Sophisticated cells with membranes around their organelles, larger volumes. Difficult for other cells to attack, and more efficient metabolism. Just two weeks. Later, on March 30th, you find the first colonies of these cells working together to form the first multicellular organism. Some of the cells in these organisms begin to specialize to specific functions, enabling yet more complex life to develop. It's on April 29th that simple animals first appear, like jellyfish and sponges. Up to now life has largely been aquatic, leaving the land untouched, but on May 1st, Earth enters the Cambrian period and with it, an explosion of life evolves in a diversity of new and wonderful directions, taking over the land and changing the oceans. You've now been on your journey for four months but four billion years have passed locally. It's staggering to think about the fact that so much time has passed here. Walking the Earth during this time is spectacular, a paleontologist's dream. Life is even more diverse than imagined. So many bizarre failed evolutionary experiments, but through trial and error life adapts, competes and evolves into fascinating and complex forms. It's just over a week later, on May 10th, that the first dinosaurs evolved during the Triassic period. Watching these giants wander the Earth is a childhood fantasy. Creatures like the Allosaurus, the Stegosaurus, the Triceratops, and of course the Tyrannosaurus rex each one simultaneously terrifying and captivating. You relish studying these giants, but just five days later an enormous meteorite more than 10 miles across enters the atmosphere. The impact is truly decimating, raising a cloud of dust into the atmosphere that blots out the sun, darkening the skies, and cooling the world. You mournfully watch as the era of the dinosaurs abruptly ends, marking the transition between the Cretaceous and Paleogene periods. It is now on May 15th that small mammals start to fill the ecological niche left open your direct ancestors. You check your watch as history fulfills itself. In two days, on May 17th, you'll pass the date that you left the Earth. Thus far, you've witnessed the past play out broadly. Familiar events inferred from the geological record, but now, now you are about to move into the future. You watch as the mammals advance over the Earth. Growing in size and complexity, great apes, hominids, homo sapiens, this is it. You're about to see her own fate, the future of the human race. At 3.48 p.m., modern humans emerge. Just 13 minutes later they begin farming and erecting buildings as you pass the Neolithic Revolution. Less than one minute after that point, 20,000 years by local time, it's over. Humanity is gone. The tape played so fast you couldn't see what happened to us. Did we move to another planet? Did we switch to artificial intelligence? Did we simply extinguish ourselves? In a flash, our cities and monuments crumble decay and disintegrate into dust, blowing off into the wind.